As Vince would say, it's the Survivor Series. WWE's second longest running pay-per-view behind WrestleMania may have been created specifically to dick over the NWA Supercard Starcade, but the show has endured for over 30 massive years in no small part to its signature match, the traditional Survivor Series elimination match, sometimes eight, mostly 10, sometimes 20 wrestlers in a single match, more meat slapping off each other than a farm explosion. Like the Royal Rumble, when these matches work, there's rarely anything better, and sure, there are been plenty of bad ones. Tune in next week for them. But for now, let's talk about the best of the best. Epic bouts crammed with lots of little moments, micro stories, iconic debuts, and jumbo star power. These are the 10 best Survivor Series elimination matches ever. And before we start the list, if you haven't already, please do subscribe to WrestleTalk. It really helps out the channel. We'd very much appreciate it and love you lots. And we'll also send you some money. Probably. We won't, but we might. We won't. Number 10, the tag team match 2016. 20 men all huddled shoulder to shoulder around the ring like a weird fence made of ham, baby oil, and gestures. These really shouldn't work. There's just too many dudes. But there's been a surprising number of ace tag team elimination matches over the years. In 80 the action was fast and brilliant, mostly thanks to the British Bulldogs and the Hart Foundation, as well as a shocking upset by the Killer Bees. Remember them. In 88, they even managed to do a big storyline angle with Mr. Fuji betraying Demolition, but 2016 pips both. Sure, there's your standard thinning out of the herd, but there's some bloody great work happening here, mostly from the Usos, who are the best. The early elimination of the New Day was a shock. American Alpha getting the briefest time to run wild as a sad reminder of what they could have been on the main roster, but the real reason this match makes the list is the blisteringly good final showdown between the bar and the Usos that could have gone on for 10 minutes longer and no one would have complained. Definitely worth a rewatch. To be honest, this match is mostly just on the list so we can all remember a time when WWE actually had 10 different tag teams. Those were better days. Number 9, The Body Donners versus The Underdogs 1995. If you want an idea of how thin the WWE roster was in 1995, at one of the big four pay-per-views of the year, they gave Barry Horowitz, the 123 Kid, post-rockers Marty Jannetty, and Hakushi 20 minutes to work and it was oddly brilliant. Eight guys going nowhere near the mid card, never mind the main event, but all going hell for leather. Watching a bunch of no-name quick dudes overperforming in the first match on the card, WWF was dressing up as WCW for some late Halloween cosplay. You've got lightning quick action, fun story beats with the evil 123 kid and Skip and Horowitz calling back their fun program from SummerSlam. There was a bloody hell top rope powerbomb. Hell, even Bob Holly busted out a head scissor takedown. Not a good one. But still, 1995 is rightly described as the worst year in WWE history, but it had a weirdly great Survivor Series with the women's elimination match and the wildcard match later on in the night both also being good. But this uncanny jobber fest narrowly beat out both. Number eight, Team Mysterio versus Team Shield 2013. The Tribal Chief gimmick is very, very good, but shout out to the original badass Roman heel mode. For pretty much the entire first year of their run, fans were waiting, just waiting for WWE to ruin in the shield because WWE fans live in a perpetual state of trauma, but it just never happened. Even when they lost for the first time, it was to crazy over Daniel Bryan. From the moment they arrived to plan B itself, the shield just kept ruling and this match was no different. Looking back, it seems like this was the beginning of a story that WWE didn't actually end up telling. Dean Ambrose was eliminated early, which began a series of hints at an Owen Hart style heel turn. Even though that didn't end up happening, it still added a Rikishi buttload of drama to this match. Ambrose and then the real Americans all get eliminated one after the other, making it five on two against Rollins and Ray. Oh no, thought fans, Mysterio's happy-go-lucky squad are going to squash the shield for a cheap babyface pop a la 2006 when DX crushed rated RKO, but we were all very wrong. The shield ended up prevailing, with Reigns taking out four dudes just by his dog self, and it was rad as hell. Number seven, Team Raw versus Team SmackDown 2005. Most of the time, the whole SmackDown versus Raw thing is a load of old shit, a meaningless gimmick that actually does more harm than good when it momentarily makes wrestlers forget about their characters in the name of t-shirt dominance. I will never forgive WWE for booking then super babyface Bailey to engage in heel ambush attacks in the lead up to Survivor Series 2016. How dare you? Storytelling to one side, aka the motto of Survivor Series these days, the 2005 Red vs Blue was bloody wonderful, almost just on star power alone. Batista, Mysterio, JBL, Michaels, Kane, Orton, with Randall Keith completing his Soul Survivor trilogy and staking his permanent claim as Mr. Survivor Series. It's ultimately meaningless, but a lot of fun, including a babyface against all odds performances for the ages by HPK, who, as we'll see later in this list, is
is really good at those. Some elimination matches rush through their talent, eliminating them after just a few moves and damaging their credibility. Some matches drag on for absolutely ages. In this match, however, the porridge was just right. Constantly exciting, Orton and Michaels doing their thing, plus a springboard move into a super kick, which is just always great. Number six, Team Andre versus Team Hogan, 1987. The first ever Survivor Series main event, and oof, that beef. Hogan, Orndorff, Rude, Bundy, Bam Bam, Andre. It was a big match of big boys. Action-wise, it's of course limited compared to modern standards, but it's most of the biggest stars in the company in front of a 1987 crowd that just really loves wrestling. A hot crowd can make all the difference, and WWF booked an absolute stormer here. The big hook of this bout is, of course, the big rematch between Hogan and Andre from WrestleMania 3, and they tease it early on, but they delay it and delay it, letting dynamic workers like Rick Rude and Orndorff carry the action. Hogan's team goes 3-2 down before the Hulkster and the Giant finally come to blows. In order to save the big fight for Mania 4, however, Hogan shockingly gets counted out, and WWF began their long-running Survivor Series tradition of building stars by having unexpected superhero performances. This time, it's Bam Bam Bigelow, who goes from being 3-1 down to eliminating both One Man Gang and King Kong Bundy before eventually falling to Andre himself. It's the kind of many plate spinning booking WWE used to be so good at. They gave Andre a big win against Hogan, preserved the singles rematch of Hogan Andre for another day, and made a star out of Bigelow, a relative newcomer to the company. Number five, the Dream Team versus the Million Dollar Team. Now that is how you debut a new star. Survivor Series 2020 is being built around 30 years of angry Chad, the tombstone dad, and they treated him like a star from day one. Look at the size of that ham hock, said Roddy Piper, and he is correct about the ham hock. Watching it back, it's amazing how good Taker was, standing stock still in the corner whenever he wasn't in the match. None of that banging the hands together and hey, do better at wrestling stuff. Just a dark glare and intermittent bursts of zombie violence. But despite Taker being the story in hindsight, there's a whole bunch of talent in this match too. Dusty Rhodes, Heart Foundation, Ted DiBiase, Rhythm and Blues to a slightly lesser extent. The match also features the company's first serious tease of a Bret Hart singles push. Like Bam Bam before him, Bret goes 3-1 down but brings it back to just him versus DiBiase, all while Roddy Piper loses his bloody melon about it on commentary. God, Hot Rod was really good at everything. The crowd are proper unglued for Bret as well, which is lovely to see. Like Bigelow, Hart loses, but in the course of one really fun match, two future Hall of Famers were born. Number four, the men's match 2016. What's this? No stakes beyond brand warfare bullshit. Shane McMahon's in it, and it's just under an hour long. It should be the hardest of hard passes, but goddamn, the 26 men Survivor Series match is a bloody match of the year. Hell, no one's even eliminated for the first 15 minutes of the sod. It's just main eventer after main eventer, and also Shane McMahon out there making the declarative statement this is the best that Raw and SmackDown have to offer. Also, Shane is here, and actually giving the time to make them all seem important. Its length makes it feel truly epic, but it's not just a lot of minutes. Every piece of the match serves some sort of storyline purpose. Ambrose and Styles work their feud, compromising their own team. Shield mini reunion, KO and Jericho receiving Canadian welcomes, but the cracks in the friendship start to show with KO murdering Jericho's list. Strowman runs wild and gets eliminated by James Ellsworth. Poor Strowman comedy murders him. Roman spears Shane's soul straight out through his body. Okay, that's not a storytelling thing, but still Jesus Christ. And the match ends with an all-time great RKO from Orton to Rollins and never winning Bray Wyatt actually pinning never beaten Roman Reigns thanks to Randy Orton's super sneaky snake help. It's just almost an hour of really fun wrestling and it's hard to argue with that. Number three, Team Austin versus Team Bischoff 2003. So what separates the top three from the rest of the pack is that not only are they bonkers good Survivor Series matches in their own right, but they also come armed with tangible high stakes. The only thing better than good wrestling is good wrestling when something's on the line. And in the match between Team Austin and Team Bischoff, they weren't just high stakes, they were rattlesnakes. I'm sorry. If Austin's team won, Austin would no longer be held to the rule whereby he couldn't biff up the raw roster whenever he wanted. But if Bischoff's team won, Austin's career was over. Significant then. Those stakes simmer under the entire match, occasionally exploding in peaks of joy and dread. Then comes the old Survivor Series booking classic. We've seen it twice before on this list. Babyface goes 3-1 down, fights back to one-on-one, -on -one, looks like a superhero, but falls at the last moment. The babyface in question is Shawn Michaels. 
putting on one of his single best match performances ever. Bleeding like a stuck pig, Jaylee legs, but still dispatching Christian and Chris Jericho, a genuine roller coaster of emotions that ultimately crushes your hopes and dreams. Wonderful. Number two, Team Cena versus Team Authority 2014. Bloody brilliant this, enough to make you forget that the rest of Survivor Series 2014 was pretty toilet, including AJ Lee losing her Divas Championship via lesbian treachery. Authority Mania had been running wild in WWE since SummerSlam 2013, and enough was enough, and it's time for a change. John Cena put together a ragtag team of plucky underdogs and also ill-advisedly the world's most dedicated heel turn enthusiast to take on Triple H's big bunch of pricks. And if the Authority won, all of Cena's team would be fired, but if they lost, the Authority would be no more. As the fans had grown tired of Trips and Steph, these were stakes that the crowd could really sink its teeth into. Looking back, it seems obvious the Authority would lose, but honestly, the Authority was so f***ing ever-present that it was no sure thing. With that in mind, oh the drama in this match. Big Show joining the Authority, Cena being eliminated early, Dolph Ziggler earning his Shawn Michaels Boy Scout badge by going 3-1 down to 1-on-1, -on -one, and then came Sting. Look, everyone, please forget how Sting's career went following this night, but the icon's debut was everything you hoped for from a legend. Arrive, change things, leave. A thunderous ending to a white knuckle match. And number one, Team WWE versus Team Alliance 2001. You know what? Yes, considering that an invasion storyline could have given us Austin versus Goldberg, Taker versus Sting, Kurt Angle versus Ric Flair on a pay per view, what we ended up getting was a chump salad. But Hot Dog Jumping Frog, the winner takes all match at Survivor Series 2001 is phenomenal. Angle, Austin, Kane, Taker, Rock, Jericho, RVD, Booker T. It was star power city. Sure, the fact that most of those guys mentioned were WWF guys is sort of the problem, but still, oof. Doesn't hurt that the stakes were probably the highest that WWE has ever booked as well, and that story was being told by Loki, the greatest announced team ever, and Paul Heyman and JR. A total wrestling package of story, larger than life characters, and just the right amount of nerve shredding over booking. Shane running interference constantly before royally getting his. Chris Jericho's ego running wild and almost blowing the whole match. Ref bumps, Angle's long con triple cross, the first two, and then the final two being The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin paying off Austin's heel turn at WrestleMania X7. It's just wrestling in all capital letters and more than matches up to the high, almost impossible esteem with which fans hold the Attitude Era. They don't get much better than this. And that's our list. Did we miss out your favorite Survivor Series match off? Let us know what it is in the comments. Don't forget to like and share this video around. And while you're here, please subscribe to WrestleTalk for more news and lists and never forget to jam that jam.